Thank you. Thank you all very, very much for being here. I first want to not only thank you all for coming and turning out, and what a great crowd tonight, but I also want to thank the Mag Lab for sponsoring Science Cafe, and I also want to thank Backwoods Bistro for hosting tonight's event. Uh, so what we want to talk about tonight is hopefully we will be able to do exactly what this slide says, beer plus science equals good conversation. And so this does not need to be a lecture by Levinson. So please, if you have questions, you have comments, I know there are people in the audience with expertise in this area, and we're all really here to learn together. So what we're going to talk about tonight is brain tumors. And you can see this uh, image here of a brain tumor. And what do you notice? You notice, first of all, that this brain, person with the brain tumor, that it's not a round ball. It's got fingers. Many of these brain tumors are very irregularly shaped. And it has a dead center. We call it a necrotic center. We also know that, notice that it's growing and it's encroaching on structures in the brain. There are 20,000 new cases of brain tumors every year. And a large majority of those are called glioblastoma multiform. And these are very deadly tumors. Unfortunately, even with our state-of-the-art treatments, patients with GBM typically only survive about a year. Now, you might be asking, who's getting these tumors? These tumors are more common in men than they are in women. They're twice as common in whites than they are in non-whites. There is a link between the development of brain tumors and brain injury, one of the topics that my lab is very interested in. And so there's uh, so many people getting this that we want to think about why is their time and their survival so short? What is it about this particular kind of tumor that makes it so deadly? First of all, it's a very aggressive brain tumor. So what's happening is cell divisions going rogue. One cell is becoming two, two cells becoming four, and continuing to divide and doing it very, very rapidly. So not only does it damage tissue structures, it can encroach on areas inside the brain and can even metastasize. It can break off and form other tumors in the brain. So a very aggressive tumor. The other reason survival is so low is because the brain protects itself. There is a what we call blood-brain barrier. The brain doesn't let things into it easily, and that includes drugs. And so there's a very small number of drugs that we can get across that blood-brain barrier into the tumor. In fact, there's only about five drugs that are effective that we can get into the brain for these kinds of tumors. So that really limits treatment. The other problem is that these are really smart tumors. They have an intrinsic ability to evade treatment. They have ways to pump those tumors, uh, pump those drugs out of cells. They have ways to go in and fix whatever the drug tried to break, to try to break the cycle of cell proliferation. Those cells, they change themselves and have this ability to evade and what we call treat and have treatment resistance. The other thing is once you treat one of these brain tumors, they're so smart they figure out how to evade that drug and they actually develop additional resistance to the treatment. So they develop chemo resistance. So what are these treatments? Well, the first treatment, the first line of treatment is often surgery and radiation. So here you see an image of a patient with a tumor on the left, and then you can see after surgery, they've taken most of the tumor out. You can see that blue arrow is pointing to where that tumor was. All right, so you've got a scar there. The tumor's gone. The problem is we can't take out every tumor. Right? There are many tumors that are operable. If you look at this tumor here, this tumor is in the brain stem. That controls your breathing. 
We can't go in and cut that out. That's an inoperable tumor. So what do you do in that case? The other problem is even if you can do surgery, even if it is operable, you can't get every single cell. There's always going to be microscopic cells. Remember, those cells are very aggressive. So you leave even a few cells behind, two becomes four, four becomes eight, and the next thing you know is you've got a recurrence of this tumor. So you go to radiation. And so we try, we take the tumor out, and then anything that might be left, even if we can't see it, irradiate it. And the irradiation targets those proliferating cells. The problem is, remember I said these tumors are smart, and they figure out a way to evade treatment eventually. They change themselves as they divide. Well, that's also true for radiation. They can actually develop radiation resistance. And so eventually, these tumors always grow back. All right, so what else can we do? Well, there's chemotherapy. All right, so chemotherapy is going to be a drug that we put into the whole body. So it's going to go in systemically. And so it can be oral medication. It can be IV medication. It goes in. And so here you see a patient who started out with a tumor. On the, this particular tumor is in the frontal lobe. So the, this picture here is this is the front of the brain, and this is the back of the brain here. And so you see this tumor here. And after two weeks of chemotherapy, you see that this tumor is shrinking. This is a drug that is targeting proliferating cells. It's targeting their DNA synthesis so that they can't divide into new cells. And after six weeks, you can see it's virtually, at least on this MRI, it's, it looks gone, right? But you always know there's a few cells there that were smart enough to evade that chemotherapy. So you got to get a drug in. You got to find a drug that gets across the blood-brain barrier. You got to have a drug that's in high enough dose to get into the tumor, because it's going to go through the whole body. And so you've got to, once it gets diluted through the whole body, it's got to be high enough to affect that tumor. But if you have a drug that that's high, then what happens? Side effects, right? And so if you think about, this is targeting proliferating cells. So, all right, my students are in the room. <clears throat> now it's quiz time. What cells in the body in addition to those tumor cells, are proliferating. What are going to be some normal proliferating cells in the body? Skin cells. What else? Blood cells. All right, bone marrow that makes what kinds of cells? Red blood cells. White blood cells. Platelets. Okay, what about hair cells? What about? GI tract, right? all of these cells in all of us are constantly proliferating. Well, unfortunately, when you give someone chemotherapy, it's going to target those cells as well, right? It's not just going to go after the tumor. It's going so this explains all of the symptoms that we had, the side effects of chemotherapy, right? Hair falls out, right? You get anemic. You get immune suppressed because of white blood cells. You get thrombocytopenia, right? Low clotting because platelet count's going to go down. You get GI problems get sick to your stomach because the GI cells are always proliferating. So all of these symptoms, the higher the drug you use to try to get it into the brain, the worse the side effects are. And even with all this, remember you've got that intrinsic resistance. So it's never going to get all of the cells, and those cells can even get smart and acquire a resistance to the drug that you give. Question? So if you found yourself left behind on Mars, and you had to operate on yourself. No, that's a joke from the book, The Martian. Um, can you not just inject some of this medicine directly inside the brain barrier into the location of the tumor? Okay, so his question was, if, if you've got all these problems systemically, why can't we just go right into the brain? And we're going to look at that approach, okay? So what we have are wafers, dissolvable wafers, about dime size, that after surgery, after the what they call debulking surgery, to take out the, the mass of the tumor, then go in and line the cavity with these wafers that are basically soaked in the chemotherapeutic agent. 
uh, and the one particular chemotherapeutic agent that's been approved is called BCNU or carmistine. And so you can see that you can actually see those wafers, and as the wafers dissolve, they dissolve uh, the, the drug in that particular area. So you're bypassing the blood-brain barrier there and putting the chemotherapy, chemotherapy right on the cell. Unfortunately, chemo resistance is still a problem. Their cells are there's still going to be some cells that are going to evade this treatment. So another approach is let's starve it to death. Let cut off the new blood vessels. Because you think about a tumor, it's growing fast, right? We said it's growing so fast that untreated probably would die in even a month or two. And so this is a tumor that's growing rapidly. It needs a lot of oxygen. It needs a lot of nutrients. And so it's going to need a lot of blood vessels. The blood vessels that go into these tumors are very leaky and sloppy. And so one theory is, can we just cut off the blood supply and kill the tumor? And so one approach now is cutting off the blood supply and adding a chemotherapeutic agent in to try to kill the tumor. And you can see here that here's this huge, huge tumor that's pressing up against all the structures, the ventricles. And then after this treatment with a monoclonal antibody that will uh, stop the blood vessels from growing into the tumor, you can see the tumor shrinks. The data suggests that this particular kind of treatment has two problems. One, it doesn't really improve the time of survival, but it does significantly improve quality of life. The second thing is that this is, this is the end of the road treatment because once you treat with this drug, then most of the other chemotherapies that you're going to try aren't going to work. So this is going to be end stage. And so that's why this is such a big tumor that's being treated with this particular so, so real resistance occurs, not just to this drug, but to every drug after you use this drug. This is chemo resistance is a big problem that we're facing with these kinds of brain tumors. And so what do we need to fight this problem? Well, the first thing is we need to figure out what are the tumors intrinsically resistant to? And we need to figure it out fast, right? Because you don't have much time. You can't mess around going in and trying to figure out in some molecular way what's going on. We need to know today what's the best treatment for this patient. What, are, is that, what, what drugs can we rule out already? The second thing we need to know is if we treat a patient, when do they start re developing resistance? When do we need to switch drugs? And we need to know that quickly. And it would also be nice for it to be something non-invasive. We don't want to have to go in and do the surgery before you make all these determinations. Can you find out right away? Can you find out in real time as you're treating the patient when, and even for inoperable tumors, you can't even go in there. Can we have something that's non-invasive that we can get in there and quickly evaluate resistance? And this is where the mag lab comes in, okay? And so what you see here is the 900. This is a magnet that, for the purposes that we're going to talk about today, is the most powerful tool in the world. Right? So we are very, very lucky at, uh, in, at FSU and in Tallahassee to have this kind of research tool here. And so what we do is we grow these tumor cells in my lab and we're talking about it could be tumor cells that come from an animal it could be tumor cells that are cell lines we get patient samples uh, so we have access to when that debulking surgery occurs we can grow chop up those tumors and actually grow those cells in the lab here we have adriana who's uh, uh working in the lab she was a uh a summer high school student actually uh here in tallahassee who uh, helped with this project and you can see that we grow them in these flasks in the lab and then what we do is we implant the tumors into laboratory rats. 
so that as you can see here, the animal, we only have to implant like 100,000 cells into a tiny, tiny little hole through a needle into the brain, and they grow a tumor. And then we can use the 900 to measure this in a living rat. All right, so here's what we, here's what we do next. We take these cells. And we can actually produce what happens in the human brain. We can produce it in a flask. We can make those cells resistant by exposing them to a little bit of chemotherapy. And then the next week, a little bit more. And the next week, a little bit more. So we have tumor cells that have acquired resistance to a tremendous amount of chemotherapy. And then the ones that have never seen drugs form tumors. And if we treat the animal, it starts working on the tumor. But the cells that have seen chemotherapy in the flask, when they form a tumor in the brain, they are resistant to it and develop highly aggressive tumors. So our question was, can we tell the difference? Could MRI be our non-invasive, really fast way of telling which tumors are resistant to chemotherapy and which tumors are going to be susceptible to chemotherapy. So how many people here have been to the mag lab and seen this magnet? OK, so a good number of people here have seen this magnet. All right, so this little big magnet here, you can see how big it is, because there's a little person here down underneath that well. There's Dr. Rosenberg there. And here you see Dr. Grant with an animal, and he's going to put it in this tube, and the tube will then go up into the magnet for the animal's MRI. And then we sit back here uh, on computer terminals, and we watch its respiration. We watch the, the animal's perfectly happy asleep while he's getting his MRI. And then what do we get out of this? Well. All right, so a very common kind of MRI is based on water. It measures water movement, diffusion, we call it. Now, if you go to get a clinical MRI, so you go to hospital and you get an MRI, you're going to probably be looking at a strength, a Tesla, of about to 1.5. Maybe if you're in a really big facility, 3 Tesla. This magnet is giving us 21.1 Tesla, right? So very high resolution pictures. So we racing can all magnet. we can always a racing magnet, as someone says up here. We can always find that tumor using a very standard approach called diffusion MRI. But what we wanted to know was something that this magnet is very good at doing that is really a developing technology. And that is sodium MRI. So using the magnet to measure and to image the element sodium. And so you can see that we can see that very same tumor using this different, this novel approach to imaging. Well, why is that significant? Well, remember we said we got two kinds of tumors that we can grow in these animals. We can grow tumors that are not resistant. We give the drug, and the drug kills most of the cells, right? Not all of them, but kills most of the cells. And when we do sodium imaging on these animals, we find the normal brain has a normal amount of sodium. In this case, it's 45 millimolar, OK? And if that doesn't mean anything to you, just think 45, all right? And you can already tell from that picture that that tumor has more, right? It's brighter, almost double. Right, when we measure. That tumor has more sodium. That's not a big surprise to us because this is a very metabolically active tumor. It's growing fast, remember? But what about our tumors that come from cells that are resistant to our drugs? Tumors that will grow even in the presence of the drug and not be killed by the therapy. Higher or lower sodium amounts? What do you see there? Lower, right? It's lower than, if you look at how bright is this tumor versus this tumor, look at that. Much of it, it looks a lot more like normal cells. Now, remind me what chemotherapy does. 
it targets the abnormal cells, right? Well, now we've got cells that the more resistant they are, so the blue ones, that's normal brain, orange is the cells that would get killed, gray is the cells that are resistant. If it's targeting abnormal cells and the sodium looks a lot more like normal. These are cells that are flying under the radar screen. These cells are evading the chemotherapy, and we think that the sodium is a good clue for us as to how they're doing that. All right? So this chemo-resistant tumor is actually looking a lot more like a normal cell. It's going incognito inside of the brain and is resistant. And so what we found is that we can tell a sliding scale. We can detect even minimally resistant cells. We don't have to have hugely resistant cells. We can have just the beginnings of the development of resistance, and we can see it with sodium MRI. And importantly, we can see it before it's ever treated. These can be tumors developed in these animals that have never seen drug before. We can tell and predict whether they would be resistant. And so this is technology that the university has applied for a patent for, because this is a new possible use of sodium MRI. So what do we need now? We need to know if it works with other kinds of tumors, right? We've only studied brain tumors, and we've only studied this particular kind of tumor, this glioma. We need to know, will this work with other deadly tumors like pancreatic cancer? Will this work with uh, lung cancer, with colon cancer, with very, these very common cancers? Uh, can we determine resistance using this technology? Can we use this technology to figure out not just if it is resistant or not, but which drugs? That would be a major advance because then we could come in before the treatment, use MRI to say what's the best treatment for this patient, not just for this kind of cancer, but for this patient. And, and hopefully the goal would to be use MRI to individualize treatment for individual patients. And then can we ultimately develop treatments to overcome the resistance? Detecting it is one thing, overcoming it is another, right? And so a lot of the work in my lab is looking at the genetics of these cells and looking at the metabolism of these cells, trying to figure out once we can detect it, can we actually do something about it? The College of Medicine also has a commitment to a machine that will enable us to do research uh, and really translate this kind of information into humans. Uh, and so there's uh, space allocated and money allocated, and so that hopefully will be something that we will be able to do in the very near future, is to actually begin to apply some of these technologies in a human setting. So before I take your questions, I want to show you my good-looking group that helps with this um, work, uh, particularly uh, Debbie Morris here, who uh, is, is very good at running the 900. Uh, Allie as well, the, uh, Debbie's a postdoc and uh, Allie is a doctoral student. We have a couple undergraduates in the lab who are uh, terrific help. Um, I also have to thank Dr. Victor Shepkin uh, from the Mag Lab, without whom none of this work would be possible. He is an amazing scientist and a terrific collaborator uh, and of course our funding. And all of you for being here and I'll be happy to...